Hello, friends of the IACL blog, and welcome to another book interview. I'm Elizabeth Perham, an assistant editor for the blog, and I'm delighted to be joined today by Donald Horowitz, who, among other things, is the James B. Duke Professor of Law and Political Science Emeritus at Duke University, is an author of eight books, has held positions as a fellow or visiting professor, research fellow or fellow at institutions in Australia, Germany, Hungary, New Zealand, Malaysia and Singapore, the United Kingdom and the United States, and has advised a number of countries about ethnic power sharing and constitutional design, particularly for divided societies. So welcome, Professor, and congratulations on the publication of your new book. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. So I have my copy of the book here that's been well read um, and it's um, really a beautiful book. It's a pleasure to read and I found it hugely enlightening. Um, so the book is called Constitutional Processes and Democratic Commitment um, and as indicated by the title, it discusses how constitutional processes can best be designed to maximise the chances of an enduring commitment to democracy being secured. Um, so to start off with, would you mind telling us a little bit about why you decided to write this book? Well, yes, I'd be happy to do that. I, I have, um, over the course of many years, seen a lot of constitutional processes up front, uh, beginning in a sort of accidental way in Nigeria during one of their con several constitutional processes some decades ago, uh, when I happened to be in Nigeria and became a consultant to one of the delegations to the Constituent Assembly, which would ask me to evaluate a proposal made by one of the other delegations for an electoral system to choose president, because they were moving at the time from parliamentary system to a presidential system, and they wanted to choose a president in a way that would uh, not be conducive to ethnic bias in the, uh, in the incumbent who was chosen. Uh, they, they actually had devised a, a unique way of doing it, of which I thoroughly approved. And what we did was to, to go over a lot of data in the course of a relatively short time to figure out how it might come out. And so I advised them to, to do it. And indeed, they did do it. That, that process, by the way, just an aside, has, has some version of it has been adopted now in, in, uh, in Indonesia and also in Kenya. How to choose the president comes from the Nigerian innovation. Uh, and and I, I observed the Iraqi process in the early 2000s uh, close up because I was a member of a government committee in the United States that was following Iraqi developments. Uh, and in Afghanistan, I was asked, not in Afghanistan, but by people in Afghanistan, I was asked uh, to uh, uh, produce a memorandum in response to some memoranda that they had gotten from American academic lawyers urging the Afghans to adopt an American system of judicial review for constitutionality in circumstances very different from those prevailing in the United States. And I was happy to produce a more balanced memorandum than, than the ones they had. And finally, uh, uh, just pulling out examples out of the hat, uh, you, you know, I think that I was involved uh, the book tell, says that I was involved in the early stages of the Fiji constitutional process that, that, that eventuated in, in a new constitution of Fiji in 1997. Uh, so I, I saw quite a lot about uh, uh, constitution processes and how they fail and how they might succeed. Uh, and that's really what impelled me to write this book. Great. Um, and so what did you, what, when you were thinking about writing the book or writing the book, what did you hope to see as the book's main contributions? And also related to that question, who did you see or who do you see as the main audiences for this book? Well, you know, the book makes an argument for consensus decision making. If you go back and, and think about constitutional processes, or in fact, almost any decision processes, there are several different standards by which one can make decisions. One can do it by majority vote. One can make a decision by negotiations in which, in which we uh, reciprocity is the, is the prevailing uh, underlying method. Or one can look for a consensus. That is, we can, you and I can look for a way of living together in politics um, that suits us both. Not because you want one thing and I want another thing, as in a negotiation, or you want, uh, or, or we want the same things but different quantities of them, which is another kind of negotiation, uh, and not because uh, I, my people have outvoted your people, but because we've agreed 
uh, we've, we've, we've agreed on, on the method of proceeding uh, with political life together. I, I've always thought the consensus was likely to do a better job than negotiation uh, or uh, voting. And, and uh, we know, for example, from studies of deliberative democracy that consensus as the standard induces people to make better arguments and to make more public regarding arguments. That is to say, not, not arguments about what's good for them, but what's good for the collectivity. Uh, we also know the same thing from jury deliberations where the jury must be unanimous uh, as for the most part, uh, juries must be in criminal cases in the United States. Uh, jury studies show that there are better arguments made, that minorities get, uh, get their views attended to more closely, that people listen to each other better when the standard is uh, unanimous decision-making. Now, in fact, if you read the book carefully, as I know you have, uh, the, my, my notion of consensus isn't exactly the same as unanimity, but it's pretty close to unanimity and it ought to elicit the same kinds of good arguments. Of course, you need all three because you can't resolve everything by consensus, even in the best processes. So once in a while, you're going to have to compromise. Once in a while, you may even be relegated to voting. But, but that's, that's what the, uh, the, main, the main contribution is. As to the audience, this is a book, I think it's not, not too filled with technical uh, material. And so it ought to be, read, be able to be read by anybody of decent, who's had a decent education. Uh, and, and, it, and specifically, it ought to be read or can be read by students, by faculty members, um, uh, and, and also, I, I'm hoping that it will be read by people who make constitutions and people who advise people who make constitutions. So I'm hoping for a broad audience, maybe not a deep audience. May, maybe, maybe it won't sell 100,000 copies, <laughs> but I'm hoping for a, at least a broadly composed audience. Yeah. And I, I mean, part of the reason I asked the question about audience was because when I read it, I found, you know, it, it is a book that's sort of enjoyable to read and not, you know, taxing or or heavily technical, like you say. So I, I think, um, yeah, it's a, you know, it's a, a good, it's both very, you learn a lot, but it's like a good read. <laughs> um, oh, I'm delighted to hear that. Um, so my next question was about why um, constitutional processes specifically. Um, so as you mentioned in, in your first answer, you've spent your career working on these kind of questions around constitution making for severely divided societies um, around the world. And you focus both on process um, as in this book and on kind of design questions. So in the preface to the book, you, said, you say that you initially saw the questions of process and design as one single subject, but then decided that they were in fact best treated separately. And this book focuses, as I've said, um, on the questions of process. Um, so I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about why you reached the conclusion that ultimately that process and design needed to be treated separately. Well, I think the process ought to be able to travel well, regardless of what the design is going to be. Uh, it, undoubtedly the process will affect the design, but the truth is that there, there are many disputes about what the right design is, especially for severely divided societies. Well, indeed, there are many disputes about the right design for all societies. Are we going to go parliamentary or presidential, for example? Are we going to go federal or unitary? Well, these are some standard questions that, that, that sometimes plague decision makers in the course of constitutional processes because they just don't agree. Uh, but if they agree on a process, uh, I think they'll, they'll do a lot better in, in sorting out those disputes. With severely divided societies, you know, there's a very big dispute in the literature between those who advocate a consociational regime. That's a regime in which um, everybody is included, all groups are included, not just in the parliament or the legislature, but they're included in the, in the government, in the executive branch of the government, uh, and in which uh, groups are said to have a veto, a suspensive veto, or maybe a final veto over policy. I find, actually, I'm not a very keen fan of that, that mode of, uh, of, of constitutional design, because I think it's conducive to a lot of stalemate because of the veto feature or, or the ability to slow things down. Um, and the, the alternative to that is the centripetal model, which, is, which, which uh, features inter-ethnic uh, coalitions of ethnically based parties, which are very common in severely divided societies. And those inter-ethnic coalitions then get together to pool their votes. The only way they can do that is to behave moderately on issues of concern to all groups. And the result is some, uh, an inter-ethnic coalition um, 
that that uh, produces some satisfactions for pretty much everybody. Uh, I think, as I say, I think that's better. But look at the disputes. You see, if you if you superimpose on that disputes about how to proceed or negotiations, when I where I want a consociational regime and you want a centripetal one, and somebody else wants neither a straight majoritarian regime, uh, you you really won't get anywhere. So I wanted to lay out a process that could travel regardless of whatever the substantive uh, disputes uh, happen to be about what the right dispensation is for a particular country. Right. By the way, I should also I should also say that uh, this is this is an argument. It's not a proof. Um, I, I don't think this is a defin this this question isn't definitively settled by my book. I just wanted to push the ball down the road quite uh, as 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 great a distance as I could. Yeah, and I think that kind of leads on to the next question, which is for me. So one of the most powerful things I thought was the combination in the book um, in building the argument of the theoretical insights which you've drawn from, um, you know, among other places, political theory and constitutional law, there's empirical insights from political science, um, and that's presented in combination with sort of many case studies from constitution making processes around the world. Um, and there's, there's a chapter long case study as well of the recent um, Sri Lankan process. Um, so I found the use of case studies um, very helpful, both in illustrating the points. Um, so, you know, trying to understanding what the, what you were saying um, and as sort of evidence towards your argument. Um, but I just had a question. So, you know, this case study, I'm working on my PhD at the moment, so case study selection and methodology, I know is always a vexed question in comparative work. And I wondered if you could speak a bit more about how you thought about these issues when writing the book. And I think you probably um, already started to answer that. Yes, um, the book takes off from a remark uh, in, uh, in another book, that is the book by uh, Ginsburg, Elkins and Melton on the durability of uh, constitutions. It's not the quite, quite the right title, I've forgotten the exact title, but it's about what, what makes constitutions durable. It's a very well-known book in the field. Yeah. Uh, and, they, and they say, look, with respect to um, process, we know Oh, there it is. Okay. Yes, the endurance. That's right. The, the endurance, endurance of the national right. constitution. They say, with respect to process, we know one thing about it, that if social group, all social groups are included, meaning all ethnic groups as well, uh, or religious groups for that matter, uh, then that's more conducive to a, a durable process. And other people have shown that inclusion indeed is also conducive to a more democratic outcome. So, uh, the question then is, what else makes for a good process for a, for a durable constitution or a democratic constitutional outcome? And uh, it, it seems to me that's a question very well worth pursuing because process choices are terrifically important. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they say, well, we can't deal with this question because by one account, there are 18 different processes and we can't, we can't process the processes uh, in, by using quantitative methods that are familiar to us. So there's going to have to be a lot of digging in case studies. I said, well, I've been involved in a lot of case studies. I think I, and, I, and, and those I haven't been involved in, I think I, I know which ones have, have been written up well enough so that one can extract material from them. But what do, I, what do we want? Well, we want, we, we, we want uh, uh, material on, on those if, if the hypothesis is the consensus should help, let's get some where there was consensus and let's get others where there wasn't consensus. And I was deeply impressed by, and by the way, my idea about consensus and constitution making originally comes from Indonesia because I was, I observed the Indonesian process very, very closely. And I wrote a book on that process called Constitutional Processes and Democracy in Indonesia which was published by Cambridge Press in 2013. So we can put a little plug for that book as well uh, along, along the way. Um, the, the Indonesians practically took no votes. They, they took one vote, but not on anything having to do with the constitution as such. Uh, they waited until they got a consensus. And so I, if that's the beginning of the hypothesis. Then along comes the Tunisian constitution of 2015, which the best write-ups say was a product of consensus supplemented by negotiation, but not really require, maybe requiring one or two votes along the way, but having overwhelmingly favorable vote at the end, which, which it seems to me supported the idea that this was a consensual document. And a consensual document involving two polarized sides, that is to say, one of them 
was decidedly and aggressively and militantly secular. And the other side started out uh, being um, representing uh, an Islamist party, which in the end came to be really not an Islamist party, but an Islamic party with a democratic agenda. And the two sides fought, fought quite a lot, but in the end, they mostly reached consensus. They did have a negotiation or two. In fact, one, if you're interested that I can tell you about, has an ironic connection to the thesis of this book. Um, but uh, they, for the most part, they reached consensus on what they were doing. It's not a perfect constitution. And as you know, there's been a a coup in Tunisia subsequently. And so you might say, oh, it discredits the, 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 the thesis, but it actually it doesn't because the coup was made by somebody who was not committed because he wasn't a member of the constitutional uh, drafting committee. He was actually, uh, for a, a time, he was in the expert committee that advised it, but he wasn't really involved in the constitutional process in a deep way. Um, he eventually became president. He came out of nowhere to be elected president. And actually, the Islamists didn't want a presidential system. They wanted a parliamentary system. Um, in any event, uh, the, the, uh, so along comes Tunisia. And then I said, gee, you know, the Indian constitution, if I recall correctly, was made by consensus. And indeed, that turned, I, when I went back and looked closely at the process for the Indian constitution, it, wasn't, it was actually made by consensus. Uh, again, a few votes and a lot of positions changed along the way. People argued, consensus involves argumentation and reasoning in a process of deliberation, which can change people's minds. And that happened in India. Quite a lot of it happened in India. So I've got those cases on one side. And then I wanted to contrast negotiated outcomes and majoritarian outcomes, because negotiation and voting are alternative ways to make constitutions. So the deals in Iraq and Kenya and Fiji and the majoritarian constitution that was made contrary to the earlier process, which was seeking consensus in Nepal. So I have those, those uh, four cases, which are ex pretty extensively examined in the book as against the three consensual cases. And it turns out that the three consensual cases are not perfect democracies, but they have much better democracy scores by any objective measures than the four uh, that were not made by consensus. Now that's not to rule out endogeneity, that is it's possible that predispositions govern, govern the choice of process. Well, that's okay, as long as we know, maybe you, we can feed back into predispositions if we know that one process is more likely to produce a result than another. But be that as it may, that, that was the way I selected the cases, uh, by which ones were well enough written up so that one could really figure out what the essence of the decision process was, and, which, and particularly those that I knew something about more intimately, uh, as against uh, uh, as against others about which we also knew a lot, but they were they were made by a different process. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, th so then I had a question. Um, you sort of spoken a little bit about the influences of sort of working in certain countries um, and mentioned the comment in the Alkins Ginsburg and Melton book. Um, but of course, you yourself uh, are one of the leading scholars in the world of um, questions of constitution making and severely um, divided societies. Um, and, but I also wondered who else's work was influential on you throughout the course of the project. Well, I can name a few people actually. Uh, Jan Elster, who is a Norwegian scholar who teaches these days at Columbia University in New York, but previously taught at the University of Chicago and then at Collège de France, um, is I think the gold standard on deliberation and constitutional processes. I don't agree with him on everything. For example, he, uh, he has a piece in which, in, which, in which incidentally he asked me to comment on it in print and I did and I expressed my disagreement with him. Nevertheless, he, he hasn't regarded me as an enemy yet, um, the, it, which is a little unusual in academic life. Um, he, he, um, he says you should avoid bad processes. We know what's bad. We don't really know what's good. Just avoid what's bad. And that's the best we can do. And for the rest, leave, leave the decision makers alone. I think we can actually do a little bit better than that. I agree with him that we don't know everything, but we do know a few things. Um, and, and likewise, uh, he says that we shouldn't allow, allow legislatures to make constitutions because uh, they will advantage themselves in their later lives. If they're going to go back to being legislators, legislators they will, they will uh, write a good constitution for the advantage of legislators. Uh, the evidence doesn't suggest that that is generally true. There, I can think of one or two cases where it has been true, but mostly it's not true. Uh, if, especially, by the way, if you get them onto 
uh, onto the consensual path because then um, they're thinking about living life together in politics. That's the way I like to think of it anyway. But anyway, I, I really do think that, that his treatments of the deliberation in uh, the uh, American constitutional uh, framing in the 1787 constitution, uh, and also in the Estates General uh, at the time of the French Revolution, uh, they, they're really quite wonderful treatments. Uh, a more practical person, but also an academic is Christina Murray, who uh, is an emerita professor at University of Cape Town, now with the UN, and, and is just absolutely, uh, she's one of the most experienced constitution makers in the world. She was involved in South Africa and in Kenya. She's been involved in a dozen others. Um, and in fact, whenever I try to communicate with her, I don't know where she's going to answer the email from. Most recently, I thought she was in Oxford, where she's living now. And lo and behold, she turns out to, to have been in, in Papua New Guinea uh, when, when I contacted her. She might just as well have been in Yemen. Um, I, I find her to be a person with remarkably good ideas. Uh, and uh, not only does she have good ideas, both in print and out of print, but, uh, which she's willing to, to provide by comments, but she also corrects a lot of my errors. And, and uh, uh, you know, a lot of people who write think that they don't have errors in what they write. I, I'm willing to presume that I do have them, but can't find them. Uh, and if you have someone who can find them for you, that's really helpful. And she's excellent at that. I've also found, by the way, your mentor, uh, I think she's your mentor, Roz Dixon, is very persuasive, especially on drafting questions. And I've been involved in one or two uh, uh, sessions with uh, Roz when she, uh, when she had really uh, perceptive things to say about how we should how we should draft this. She has, it, well, you'll see her, that she's figures in the book about drafting long and drafting short. Uh, and, and her observations on that, I think are quite cogent. So those are, th those are some of the people who are most influential, I would say. Great, thank you. Um, then I just had a, a sort of a general question. Um, again, you know, I'm coming from an early career point, um, point of view, but I think this is interesting to um, all, all of us kind of in the, working on these sorts of, you know, working on academic projects. Um, what, were the, what were some of the main challenges that you faced in writing the book? Just kind of any kind of challenges? I can think of two kinds. One is, is at a certain level trivial, trivial, but very annoying. There's always something missing in the middle of something that you've written. Um, so you write a chapter thinking that you're going from uh, A to Z um, and you're going a, B, C, D, E, F, G, and lo and behold, you go back and it turns out that L, M, N, O, and P are missing. Um, just because uh, your mind um, skipped over those things. And going back, I think, is much harder than doing it the first time. Going back to fill in a missing piece is, that's just, I know this, that's trivial, but as I say, it's something that always happens in every major book that I've ever written. Uh, and you, you do need to go back and fix it up. That, but that's, as I say, there's not much I can say about that, except you better do it. That's all. If you see something missing and it's important, uh, some people don't, don't bother. They say, I'm on to the next project already. It's too late. But you need to fix it. But more important than that, this book, as I say, has an overriding argument about consensus. And I think you'll agree that it, whether you agree with the argument or not, I think you'll agree that that's, that's sort of the theme in a way. But there were other things I also wanted to say. I wanted to deal with ripeness. For example, Yemen and Somalia um, shouldn't have tried to make constitutions because they, things were too disorderly there. Uh, and in fact, the constitutional effort in, in Yemen uh, only inflamed the Houthi rebellion and also the secessionists in the South, the Hirox in the South. Um, so uh, I wanted to say something about ripeness and how to handle ripeness. If it's not ripe, I, I, have, I think I have a pretty good solution for that, which is to say, if you have an interim constitution that is not the one you want, but it's serviceable at least for making the new constitution, use that uh, and, and uh, stick with that for a while until, until the time is ripe for making a new constitution. Um, some others uh, that I wanted to deal with, faithless interpretation. There's some really great cases of faithless interpretation in Malaysia, which is now just beginning to come out of some of that and, 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 to, pursue, and to produce much better interpretations by a process that's, that's fascinating to watch. I've just been working on some of that today, actually. Uh, but uh, uh, or reneging, uh, why does the next generation renege? Uh, 
Well, it reneges more often actually uh, with respect to bargains that it sees in retrospect as having been unfair than it does uh, on consensus. That's at least my working hypothesis. Or timing, timing in Sri Lanka, uh, where the time was always out of joint. They, they, they started out right after a good election that was favorable to, to the new process, but they wasted a lot of time both in, in, in uh, public participation, which is another question that I also wanted to integrate into the into the book, because I've always had strong views about that and how, how public participation was oversold. It's not useless, but it was certainly oversold in constitutional process studies. Uh, they, they did waste a lot of time on, on, on public participation that only told, taught them something that they already knew, namely that the public was divided on the question. And furthermore, um, they, they, they had a problem internal that I didn't emphasize very much in the chapter on Sri Lanka, but had, had an internal problem with their experts. Their experts disagreed with a lot of the procedures that were being used, not so much with the substance, but the procedures that were being used. And they didn't control the experts very well or make very good use of them. That slowed them down. And by the time they were done, they had a different timing problem. Namely, they were running up against an election in which uh, uh, an unpopular a, a president who had been unpopular in 2015 suddenly became popular again, and he was about to return to office. He's now now the prime minister. He couldn't come back as president. His brother, however, was the president. So you get the idea um, that it's a family business, indeed, in more ways than one it is. So they then their consensus fell apart at that point. Then they had to abandon the project. Uh, so th those weren't the only problems. The big, the major problem, the overriding problem, was that neither the president, as of 2015 to 18, uh, and the prime minister, neither the president nor the prime minister, who were from different parties but had lined up for the 2015 elections, was really committed to the venture. They were both afraid of it in a certain way. They were afraid of, of, of losing some of their clientele to what, what might become an unpopular venture. So they, they defected in advance, actually, in a certain way. So there were many problems. And I wanted all of these, I wanted to integrate all of these into the book. And I had to do a separate chapter on Sri Lanka. There was no way to do this short of a full, a full uh, in, engagement with Sri Lanka. The interviews were conducted by, either by telephone or by Zoom, because by then we were into the pandemic and there was no chance to, to uh, to just drop into Sri Lanka for this purpose, quite the opposite. So those were, those were some of the things I wanted to include and, and I didn't want them to detract from the consensus argument. So the consensus argument sort of is, is, yeah, is it, well, it's at the beginning, it's heavily at the beginning. And then it's also pervasive through various threads in the book that, that deal at the same time with some of the other, these other problems. But that is a hard thing to do. If you have one overriding theme and a number of subsidiary issues, it's very hard to integrate them well. And I, I hope that I, that I didn't completely fail to do that. No, not at all. <laughs> I don't think you, I think you did that well. Um, so just the final question I wanted to ask um, what, was whether you could tell us what's next for you in terms of academic projects. Yes, uh, three things actually. Um, I'm the co-editor of a book on Malaysia's electoral reform proposals uh, that were put out uh, by a commission that was, or maybe I guess it's called a committee, but it's essentially a commission uh, that was uh, assigned to do the work during the previous regime, during the, re the, the regime that came to power in 2018, but fell in 2020. Nevertheless, they produced a quite complete report um, dealing with many aspects of electoral reform, which are long overdue in Malaysia, ranging from whether, whether to deal with malapportionment, they said no, but I think that Eventually, they have to do that. Electoral system reform, real change in the electoral system they propose, changes in the way the Electoral Commission operates, uh, changes perhaps in the way in which uh, legal challenges to election results proceed and so on. So this is a kind of soup to nuts, as it were, um, a set of proposals. And this, the book tracks all of those and some others. For example, the uh, role of civil, uh, civil society in producing reform proposals, which then get picked up by the, by the commission dealing with electoral reform. It's an edited volume. I'm the co-editor and I wrote the chapter on the electoral system proposal, which tries to show, I think does show actually, that the electoral system proposal will not achieve the objectives that are uh, set out for it in the commission's report and will have some other, I think, adverse effects. Uh, but that's neither here nor there. All of these subjects are, are dealt with and uh, we're right at, at the point now where we're approaching a, a, a publisher. Um, 
but there'll be more work to be done. There always is in the course of an edited volume, much more than anybody who gets involved in it ever thinks. Um, the second project I'm nearly finished with actually a, a book on federalism, regional autonomy and ethnic conflict because federalism and regional autonomy are frequently recommended to deal with ethnic conflict, sometimes with some considerable success. Um, there are two big surprises in this book as I went through it. I've worked on this problem off and on for many, many years. And I, I, the, some of these results really do surprise me. I've dealt with most of the major federations and major regional autonomy schemes in Asia and Africa. That is to say, it's not a sample. It's, it attempts to be fairly comprehensive. And the two big surprises are the following. There's an argument that um, if you produce a federal regime in an ethnically divided country, and there are certain units that are populated by particular groups that are a minority in the country as a whole, but a majority in those units, as for example, in Scotland or in, in Catalonia um, or in, in, uh, in many other countries, uh, you will foster secession. But actually, uh, successful secessions don't seem to eventuate from such federations. If you, re if you reason about it very carefully and you look at the cases very closely, um, this is a big surprise. It won't be taken very well by some people who are, are pretty well wedded to that argument, that's for sure. Um, the other, however, which I think will be less controversial but maybe more surprising, is that devolution to uh, units that are um, inhabited by majorities, whether they are majorities in the country as a whole or majorities merely in those units, are very, uh, works out very, very poorly for minorities in those units. That is, there's a tremendous amount of violence, oppression, uh, lack of freedom, uh, discrimination against those minorities in many, many countries that have had this kind of devolution. And it's serious. Why is, why does it, is it allowed to fester? Because this, it's a rule of law pro problem because uh, most countries haven't figured out how to cope with discrimination. Uh, they haven't figured out effectively how to uh, produce legal remedies for discrimination and how, for, example, for that matter, to, to produce police that don't discriminate when there's violence. Um, this problem is pervasive and I will have, I, I'm not quite, I, I'm still documenting it. I'm in the, in the last chapter documenting all of it. Uh, and I, I, I will come to some suggestions for how to, not how to adopt a rule of law where there isn't one, but how to shore up the rule of law where there are the rudiments of the rule of law, but, it's, but they're not being effectively utilized. Uh, so that's that. Now, in the meantime, I've got another book that I've been working on for years <laughs> that's been left standing while I've done these other things. Uh, it's a big comparative book on power sharing among ethnically divided in ethnically divided countries and why it's so hard to do. Power sharing is a big adoption problem because majorities want majority rule and minorities want freedom from majority rule. Uh, I've written something, actually I've written a brief piece in the Journal of Democracy in 2014 on this very question, which is called, I think, Ethnic Power Sharing, Three Big Problems. But this book is going to be a big, long book. And that's one reason why I decided that, that I, I absolutely had to write the process book separately and definitely not incorporate that in it. And likewise, the same for the federalism and regional autonomy book, uh, I, I, because I want this book to be under 500 pages. My, one of my early books in ethnic politics, which is called Ethnic Groups in Conflict, goes 684 pages. And that's a bit too taxing for most people. Um, by the way, I'll tell you something funny. This is a good closing remark, perhaps. The Ethnic Groups in Conflict is an exceedingly well-cited book, but mostly, I think, by people who haven't read it. Because they, they say, I'm, I'm looking for a citation where it says such and such is the case in an ethnically divided country. And they say, well, Horowitz has 684 pages. It must be in there. I'll cite that. So, <laughs> yes, you, you know, frequently cited books have two different sides. One, they're influential on the merits, uh, and therefore they're cited. Or two, they're presumed to be compendious, and therefore they're cited. Uh, and I've, I've, I've always been afraid that ethnic groups in conflict is cited because it's presumed to be compendious. <laughs> it's a very interesting insight to end on. Um, thank you so much, Professor Horowitz, um, for your time. And thanks also um, to our listeners and viewers on the ISU, our blog, for joining us um, 
wait, today or into the future. Um, so just to listeners and viewers, if you've enjoyed this discussion and you're interested in getting a hold of the book, um, there'll be some information about that in the um, new titles section on our website. Um, and for more of the same, to keep up to date with the blog, you can follow us on Twitter or subscribe to our mail list. Uh, and lastly, if you've recently published a book on constitutional law and you'd like it to be featured on the blog, please just get in contact with us um, at iacl.blogeditor at gmail.com. Um, thanks very much, Professor Horowitz. And, uh, Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.